so much, Angela, and good evening, Singapore. I'm so delighted to have this opportunity, and I'm learning some very, very new skills with Zoom and Instagram Live that have been quite recent things. But one of the most important things I've found about wine tasting, Angela, is you need some wine in your glass. So welcome, uh, Bruce Dukes here from Domain Naturalist. And so I'm in Margaret River, so I'm in the very, very southwest corner of Western Australia in a, a tiny, tiny wine growing region called Margaret River. And Margaret River is just a, a beautiful wine growing region. And you can see, actually on your screen now, there's a map of my little region. And if you, if you look at the, the top of the map in the very north, uh, it's called Cape Naturalist. And where I am sitting at the moment is in my house that's about 15 minutes away from my, my vineyard, a domain naturalist that you can see on the map. And so the very, very southwest corner, so we're about three hours drive southwest of Perth. And it's, it's quite a small area. And so from, from the north at Cape Naturalist to the south at Cape Lewin, it's about 100 kilometres from north to south and about 30 kilometres from east to west. And so, so quite a small area. And one of the, the main sort of characters of this area is to the north, we have the beautiful pristine Indian Ocean. To the west, we have the, the pristine Indian Ocean. And to the south, we have the Great Southern Ocean. And so it's kind of nice that we're actually cradled on three sides by the ocean. And that has this most beautiful insulating effect that gives us a very long, gentle growing season. And so although we're only about three hours south of Perth, we've got a much softer climate. And so Perth is called a, a Mediterranean climate, warm, wet winters, uh, well, warm, warm, dry summers, cool, wet winters, Plenty of, plenty of rainfall off the Indian Ocean during the winter. And Margaret River is just a little bit softer. So it's actually called a maritime climate. And it's that beautiful, long, gentle growing season. That's one of the longest sort of growing seasons around that allows a number of different grape varieties to grow there and express themselves really well. And so we've got that beautiful climate, the beautiful, plentiful winter rainfall from the southwest. And so our water comes off Antarctica from the Great Southern Ocean to the southwest. So it's really sort of beautiful, high quality rainwater that we get. And most, most of that rainfall, and we get about a metre of rain a year, but most of that rainfall occurs during the winter months. And so in the summer months, sort of from uh, September on to harvest of Cabernet that might be in early April, it's relatively dry. And so what that gives is uh, a lovely, very, very low disease pressure environment. So it's just really nice for grapes to grow in. And if you kind of think of people like grapevines, it's a lovely soft climate. So it's so lovely for people to be in and so the, the climate's sort of one part of the overall journey and another part of that overall journey to me is the soils what because the vines if you whatever you sort of see growing above the soil they've effectively got the same amount deep below in the soil and so we have these really sort of ancient soils that are formed from granite. And so literally between Cape Naturalist and Cape Lewin, it's a huge uplifted coastal landform of granite. And it's that granite that's quite simply rotted in place that's formed these beautiful soils for grapevines. And it's 
kind of so easy to see. And you look on the map where it sort of shows Domain Naturalist Vineyard, well, where, where exactly seven kilometres in, oh, I can see your pointer. We're exactly sort of seven kilometres in from the Indian Ocean on these beautiful sort of decomposed granite soils. And one of the things that I think a, a plant like Cabernet likes is the relatively lean, relatively hard soils that just provide enough water, nutrient over the growing season for the vine to grow, but to achieve a sense of balance and a sense of symmetry. And so that really means that the vines have a lovely balance between their shoots and the amount of fruit that's there. And so that, that balance in the vine is everything. And what I try and do and my real interest in, in wine is what I describe as actually wine growing. And the, the importance of, of wine growing is that it's not just getting the fruit when it's ripe, picking it, turning it to wine. It's about working with the strengths of nature in agriculture so that we can farm a crop that suits its site, that ripens so that we can then translate it through to wine or whatever it is with minimal intervention. And, and that to me is a, a fundamental success in agriculture. Because when, again, when you can get your crop right uh, and do very little to it, that's where you have success. So, and really that's, that's, that success and the sustainability of those systems are what I really love because my first life is I'm, a, I'm an agronomist. So I love focusing on soils and plants, climate. My second life is with winemaking, but what I really love doing is joining together the grape growing with the winemaking as a single sort of holistic entity. And, and that's where I find the great rewards are. So if you're not familiar with Margaret River Cabernet, we can sort of talk about where it might sort of sit in a, a global context. And I often think about climate as the best way to explain things in the global context. And so if, if we think on the table on your left, you'll have your fork, the plate in the middle, and on the right, a knife. That in, in grape growing uh, and, and a lot of agriculture, we talk about the amount of warmth accumulated over a growing season. And so with three great Cabernet areas, if we think on the left, the fork as being Bordeaux, in the center we have the plate that's Margaret River, and then on the, the knife side is Napa Valley. So in my opinion, three absolutely beautiful Cabernet Sauvignon areas. And so what we have is Margaret River just has a little bit more accumulated warmth over the growing season than Bordeaux, but still a fair bit cooler than Napa. We have a fair bit less summer rainfall than Bordeaux and about the same amount as Napa. And so it's almost by looking at those climates uh, with Bordeaux being slightly cooler than Margaret River, Margaret River a little warmer, and Napa Valley quite a bit warmer, that the climate has the greatest sort of impact on the personality, the expression of the vines. And so the, the qualities of Margaret River Cabernet are probably captured by those climatic elements. And with, with this map, and again, just having a look at the map, think about the Bordeaux is this beautiful coastal area uh, with the Atlantic Ocean directly to its west. Uh, Margaret River has the Indian Ocean to its west, to its north, the Great Southern Ocean. And Napa Valley has the Pacific Ocean uh, just to the very west of it. And so we see these three climates that have really strong maritime uh, influences on them. 
And again, it's this long season that allows the Cabernet plant to slowly form its perfumes, its tannins, all the elements of its personality that I think are the reasons why all those three regions make such delicious Cabernet. The, the interesting thing is that Margaret River too has lots of different elements that, that sort of back up and join in with the understanding of the story. And so with that very, very long, gentle growing season in Margaret River, the whole of the Southwest area being Margaret River is also quite a, a biodiversity hotspot. So meaning that that soft, gentle climate with the winter rainfall allows for lots of different plant species to proliferate in the area. And then with all those plant species, we get all the animal species, the associated microbiology. And so it's actually kind of a, just, just a nice area for things to grow. And that includes me. So with my Cabernet, uh, this is the 2017 Domain Naturalist Discovery Cabernet. And of course, as you uh, were noting on, oh, this is my beautiful cellar door, but we're actually overlooking my Cabernet vineyard uh, where the Cabernet in my glass is from. And so the, the northern part of Margaret River, being Cape Naturalist, is where I live and my vineyards are at the base of Cape Naturalist. And so Domain Naturalist is actually named after the geographic area in which I live, in which my vines live. And the big, big part on my, on my wine label for Domain Naturalist, you'll, you'll see the ship's wheel, and that really signifies uh, stability, direction, and of course, the reliance that we have in Margaret River as a farming area on that beautiful, soft maritime climate. And then on, on my label, sort of hanging off the elements of the ship's wheel, uh, some clouds, some grapevines, wine, knives, forks, feathers, that essentially it's showing that if all these elements of the system, so the, the climate, the food, the culture of the area are all hanging in a balance, I think we have success in the system. But if, if any of those sort of elements aren't in balance, then we don't have harmony in a system and things don't work. And part of, part of that label imagery too, uh, sort of is, is a part of my history because uh, after I was uh, an agronomist in my early days with my such strong interest in winemaking, I ended up uh, working, living in California, uh, working at UC Davis, a wine university there, then loved that so much. I actually went back there, went back to school with winemaking in the, in the early 90s, uh, lived and worked actually for five years in the Napa Valley. And of course, the image, the North American image of the dream capture is, is something from my history and something that, that's embedded in these wines and my sort of early training, I guess, in Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, which sounds a little strange being an Australian, but was actually in the Napa Valley, where I spent five years uh, working for Francis Ford Coppola on his beautiful historic estate in, in Rutherford in, in Napa Valley. Could we pop to the next slide, please, Angela? So a big part of the enjoyment of wine too, and actually this is my, my cellar door. And so on one side of the cellar door are some of my Sauvignon Blanc vines. The other side are some Merlot vines, followed by Cabernet. But I, I just love the, the cultural aspects associated with wine too, enjoying it with groups of friends. Uh, and so this connection between wine, food and culture to me is, such an important thing. And so in, in Margaret River, 
Cabernet has this special affinity to the climate because it will ripen at the very, very end of the growing season. And what's happening is as we're approaching the end of the season, the daylight hours are shrinking, the temperatures are contracting, and it's approaching the first rains of winter. And what that does is allow a very gentle finishing to the ripening of Cabernet. And we have these beautiful, cool, sunny, autumnal days with early 20 degree C temperatures, crystal clear blue skies, and they're just gorgeous conditions for finishing off the Cabernet. And if you think about the, the Cabernet and the cool conditions at the end of the season, that when you put perfume or aftershave on, on a cool day, like at the end of a season, we'll maintain those perfumes on our bodies for a long time. When we put them on a hot day, they volatilize quickly. And so you can see this is, this is where climate sort of fits in and has a real reason that those cool conditions at the end of the season allow beautiful capture of the perfumes in the fruit. And so to the wine, which I haven't really talked about because I get so excited about my entire area, but with this Cabernet wine, the, the berries are quite small. They have quite tough skins. And so when I harvest them, I'll de destem them completely and just split the individual whole berries so that the juice of the Cabernet Sauvignon can come out. And so we'll typically have a fermentation that's uh, a week to two weeks long in tank. And then the Discovery Cabernets what I call a very pure translation of the wine to the fruit because it's all, all matured for a full 12 months in seasoned French oak casks. And so seasoned means the casks have had a little bit of time, two or three years of use. And so most of the woody, toasty elements have gone from the casks. And so the casks act as these beautiful, soft breathing containers that allow the wines, tannins to soften and grow, but really preserve and protect the personality of the wine. And so the Discovery Cabernet is, is really based on the, the tannins and perfumes of the Cabernet versus some other styles that I make that are based on the tannins, the perfumes of the fruit, plus oak tannins and oak perfumes. And so in this case, to me, it just gives a very fruit pure and quite soft wine. And one of the things I love about Cabernet is the inclusion of just small amounts of, hello, of uh, Merlot and Malbec. And so I think of the Cabernet as this beautiful main act or this beautiful piece of steak on a plate. And the little bits of Merlot is like a, just a grind of salt. And then a little sprinkle of pepper is the Malbec and they're just small little sculpting elements that go into it, but really enhance the main dish, but don't take away from it. And so this wine is, a, is about 90% Cabernet Sauvignon with the remainder of this sort of sculpting splash of Malbec, uh, around 5% and around another 5% of just this very silky, plummy merlot and those small amounts of the the spice rack i call it just extend uh the palate complexity the softness uh and it it's just delicious with so many foods and apart from uh things like steak or lamb cooked on open grills one of the favorite things i love and here it comes is I think this wine's just a lovely match for duck. And this, this wine with the, the tannin, the fruit freshness, the natural acidity, I just think it makes such a wonderful uh, match with so many duck dishes that have the flavor, the fattiness of the skin. And so that's one of my, one of my favorite sorts of matchings. 
All right. Well, thank you. So we had a first sort of a glance and a comprehension of the Margaret River. So thank you very much. So first, first here we're going to maybe move on to the wine tasting of the wine. So we're going to describe the different colors and aromas that you can get in the glass. Everybody got their glasses ready? All right. So I will at least share what I think, shall I? Well, I, I always like, I pour the wine and have a look at it and I, I see these beautiful sort of red, purple characters at the side. And just this lovely, inviting sort of richness and vibrancy that, that to me just says, hello, I'm Cabernet, I know who I am. Then I find a, a real locator to me with Margaret River Cabernet you know the, the tiny little black fruits called mulberries? So the, the tiny little black fruits called mulberries uh, have this very sort of uh, red current, cassis-like aroma and flavour. And I actually think those, those perfumes, those aromatics are just beautiful. And so I actually find that character uh, quite a locator for Margaret River Cabernet. Um, and like we say, talked about Margaret River Cabernet or while I think of, say, like Bing Cherries with some beautiful Napa Valley Cabernets, it's the, the, the mulberry aromatic that strikes me about Margaret River Cabernet. And so at least for me, in this wine, the mulberries, uh, plum, hints of five spice uh, and the most sort of subtle little hint of licorice and this is almost the, the joy of Margaret River Cabernet because you can go and explore all these aromas, put the glass down or have another bite of food, the acidity, the tannin refreshes, you come back and there's all this other uh, set of aromas and flavours to explore. And on, on, the, on the palate, I find it's important that I, I like my Cabernet. I want to know that I'm drinking Cabernet and so it has a lovely tannin definition and to me a uh, quite a pleasant tannin definition because i want to feel the tannin in my mouth i want it to coat my mouth and gently dissolve and that's what i call good tannin uh if i picked up a green banana and bit that that's what i would call bad tannin that's an aggressive tannin like you've been smacked in the mouth and so i think the margaret river tannins are these beautiful coating tannins that dissolve and gently fade over time, but as they carry flavour through the wine. And so that's kind of how I enjoy my wine. And probably one of the most important things is to sort of enjoy it with a group of people because it is this sort of fun thing. And I almost think of it as this cultural journey because there's nothing I sort of enjoy more on a weekend than hunting around for some really nice sort of produce, uh, like steaks, things like that, to sort of cook on an open fire with a group of friends and actually match it to wine. And, you know, no, you probably don't really need your duck decanter, but you know what, it's, you know, kind of, kind of fun to have it. And all of these things are fun and enhance the enjoyment of it. Now, Angela, what, what, what sort of foods would you match with this wine? So from the last time I tried it, I really, I ordered, uh, I, I drank it at Wine Connection, actually. I was with some friends and I had it with the sirloin. I'm, I'm a big sucker for Cabernet Sauvignon and a nice piece of steak. So I took it with Ah, that. perfect. Really well. Yeah. My really, heart's really well. into yours. Um, the, the simple but pure experience are just uh, lovely. Yeah, the fattiness of the meat that goes really well with the tannins and catsup. So I definitely recommend it with that. <laughs> and they, these wines, I, I think, and the wines in general coming from Margaret River, we've got a really nice time in history where we've got lovely sort of cores of flavour and tannin density, but the wines still have an approachability while young, uh, which I think is very important because at least for me, wines always have to have a greatness about them if they're great wines or good wines from the beginning. And that if, if they're great wines and have all the raw, raw ingredients there together that are in balance, they will age and get increased complexity. 
Um, but it's it's very rare that the ugly duckling ever turns into this. And so you, you've got to have all the elements in balance. And I mean, I that's what I strive for in my wine and almost as a bigger entity, that, that's what I see as one of the joys of, of Margaret River Cabernet. All right. Yeah. I'm sure everybody's enjoying it right now. I'm actually going to go around and see what everybody thinks of the wine, the aromas, of the taste, of what they would, maybe Fantastic. what they're eating with it or what they think of eating with it. I'm going to go well, first. Well, I've just had sirloin yeah. steak ah. and it worked really well. <laughs> and I'm not joking. It's, not a, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask the first person. I'm going to ask Ross. Okay, Ross, I'm going to meet you now. Okay. Hi, Ross. <laughs> what do you think of the wine? Have you tried it before? Uh, what, what are your first impressions? Um, I have. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yeah. I can, yeah. Ross. How are you? Hi, Bruce. Um, I'm a West Aussie. I'm lucky enough to have a, a place not far from your cellar door. Um, oh, and fantastic. Can I first of all congratulate you on, A, being a brilliant, contract winemaker to start with and now the move to your own vineyard's been exceptional so um well done on your, your cv to date mate well it's um, been a really exciting journey it's been a, it's been a 30 year journey yeah uh, no, i appreciate that you're one of the more experienced blokes going around thank so, you so i mean for, for mine um cab sav is as we all probably a lot of people on this call know already is, is a by definition, almost, almost defines Margaret River. So for me, it's it is the um, embodiment of of the region in terms of being smooth and silky, um, full bodied, um, having that punch to it without being. Um, it, it's not a wine that will blow your head off in the Australian vernacularism. Um, it's, it's much more subtle than that. And I, having spent time in the UK, I enjoy it with a, a slab of French cheese, and a and a hard. Oh, and I'll also enjoy it with um, some some, um, some bovine as well. So the way, you, how, would you, how would you define it? For me, um, it, it has got that um, subtleness, but also that strength, if that makes sense. Um, it's not as a wishy-washy wine. It has got its own uh, stability. It stands on its own two feet. And tell you what, you, you could drink it, you could drink more than one bottle, which is probably, probably easily done. Oh, it, it's lucky it's full of all those antioxidants and good things for your blood, Ross. It's, that's the way I look at it. I've always taught, been taught that. I, I think your Cabernet is, is very similar to that. And, and Margaret River Cabernet to me is about that fruit freshness, the, the ripe, ripe tannins and the, the balance of, of natural acidity. Uh, and to me, they they mainly define the, the style of Margaret River. And so I think it's important these wines have context and relevance to our cultural time. Uh, the Discovery Cabernet is usually about 13.5 to 14 degrees of alcohol. And I just find that the slightly lower alcohols allow a little bit more perfume to come out and... I guess the, the alcohol is an interesting thing because big part of what I try and do is actually grow the, grow the wine in the vineyard. And so I think of the, the grapes as they actually need, like we do at the beginning of the season, to come out, have gentle sun on our skin. And just as we develop melanin in our skin and we go brown gradually, well, the grapes actually develop tannin in their skins. Uh, and they'll accumulate the tannin as their natural sunscreen. And that's actually part of the ripening. And a big part of that ripening and the sunlight on the fruit as it grows is also uh, burning up some of the more herbal elements. And so what I seek to do with the, the wine growing side of things, Ross, is, is try and get all those herbal elements gone from the fruit so it's got beautiful levels of tannin caused by the, the sunlight exposure over the season. So I can get what I call uh, physiologically ripe fruit, but at relatively sensible sugar levels. And that's, that's basically what I spend my life trying to do with Cabernet in the, in yeah, the sure. I, I can see that. And sorry, Angela, I just realized I haven't had my video on, so I'll 
say hi now. Oh, hi, Ross. <laughs> there you go. Um, with, with what you just said then, and I think it backs into your previous comments before about the, the, the climate we have down south and that it's, it's so, I don't want to use the word predictable, but it, it's um, something you can almost rely on to the extent where you've got some consistency. Um, if we were all over the shop, you wouldn't have that confidence, I don't think, in producing a wine as you do. I, I feel blessed to be in a climate like Margaret River. And although every season is uh, a little different, and I love that because I like the different years have their own personality. Yeah. But that beautiful sort of hug we get from the Indian Oceans, Great Southern Oceans, really softens it and it makes it just such a lovely, reliable place to grow fruit and, and what I call, again, a successful place for that type of agriculture. Uh, and so I, I just feel blessed to be a winemaker in Margaret River. And again, with that climate overlaid on those ancient soils that have been in place almost forever because we're, we're tectonically very stable. Uh, we've just got so many nat natural elements joining together to, to give this wonderful opportunity for the grapevines to grow in. Yeah, I don't want to hog the time, Andrew. I know everyone else wants to probably have a go, but, and I do have to go as well. But my point to that, uh, Bruce, is that you can grab a bottle of Cab Sav from Margaret River and you have confidence in what you're getting. To me, that, that's, that, that's really important as a, con as a consumer to know what it says in the label is, is what you're going to drink. And there's so many other places that don't give you that level of confidence and, and comfort when you reach for a bottle of wine. Oh, I, I find that. I, I just love Margaret River Cabernet. And, and you also sort of think of the, the purity of the area with effectively all, all the weather coming from the southwest, meaning it's off the Great Southern Ocean. And the only thing below the Great Southern Ocean is Antarctic. So it's just such a, a level of purity and trust and food safety. So, you know, with that too, it's like the, the water in Margaret River, our rain, rainwater, it's just so, so lovely to drink. It makes such lovely coffee. It's, you know, the, the water's lovely too. <laughs> well, congratulations again. I'll pop in for a cup of tea when you're in the area. I'll, again, I'll, I'll, drop, I'll drop you a line. Cheers. I'll, I'll send you an email. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, uh, So we have a fan uh, of the of the Naturalis, uh, Margaret River over here. I'm glad you're enjoying the wine. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Well, um, so thank you very much, Ross, for those uh, comments. I'm going to go over and see if anybody has any comments or questions, um, either through the chat or feedback that they'd like to share. I'm going to check maybe with, let's see, with... Uh, Mike. So Mike has a few questions that he sent forward to me that I can help ask in the session. But if you have any immediate questions you'd like to ask or feedback, go ahead. <laughs> I, I can't actually remember all of the questions I asked, but um, a lot of those have been already answered by Bruce. So um, it was climate, it was soil. Um, so the things that were affecting the wine. I like, I really like the color in this. And I'm one also that really, when I taste a cab, I really want to, I want to know it's a cab. I want to, you know, it, it's the tannins in this, but also not overpowering tannins and, uh, and not overpowering fruit. I don't want too much, uh, too much fruit forward either. I want to, I want it all blended. So this is very, really nice, really nice. Well, I've been, I've been practicing now for 30 years and I, sort of think of things like elegance, balance, restraint, all these characters that have been denied of me personally by the, the greater forces in this universe. I try and uh, seek to instill those characters in my wines and live vicariously through that. And uh, a, a really important part to me is the balance. And I find if grape varieties, and particularly red varieties, get too ripe we can go from them from having an identity that 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 ties them to the variety and whether it be uh cabernet sauvignon or barbera or zinfandel 
that if you go too far and get too ripe, you start getting into the dark and very sort of black fruit elements. And it's actually hard to tell what it is when it passes a point of ripeness. And to me, I, I think it's important. I want to know what I'm drinking. I want to know it's Margaret River Cabernet and having that varietal stamp on it, uh, it is important to me at least at this point in sort of history and time and with our current set of cultural values. What would you match this with, Mike? Um, well, steak for sure, but I also like the idea of having it with duck as well. Oh, fantastic. Well, I hope you'll, again, come and visit sometime when you're in the hood. <laughs> Will do. We were, we were in Margaret River last... Christmas. Christmas. Oh, Christmas. And uh, we didn't get far enough north, apparently. Ah, well, I look forward to welcoming you when you get far enough south this time. We'll, we're sure, we, we'll <laughs> sort of see you. Cheers. Thanks, Mike. Hey, we've got some uh, future summer trips planned for people who are enjoying the session. Um, I'm actually going to go over to see Evelyn, who's enjoying the wine with Tom de Savoie, which is a French semi-hard cheese and apricot and walnut. She has a question. Oh, wow. uh, what is the best time to visit Margaret River? Well, it's di different horses for different courses, but I, I find at least late November, to mid-December are beautiful because the, the weather is gorgeous. Um, and, and Margaret River, you know, beautiful for the wines, but I find it an area that sort of has more. And so it's so beautiful to go and explore the, the coastline. It's a time that you can go swimming at that time of the year. Uh, the subterranean limestone cages, caves. Uh, but I, I, I like, and, and it's really not busy. November to sort of mid-December and any time over Christmas until February uh, it's a lot warmer uh, a dry warmth and when I say warm I'm talking about some early early 30s so gorgeous weather and even like now depending on what you're looking for that it's a beautiful quite I don't know why I've got no shirt uh, jump on but it's a, a sort of an autumnal night with a clear sky uh, we've got the log fire going in the going on behind us, and so there's kind of a lot of joys in winter too. But if you like swimming and the outdoors, come late November to early December, I reckon is rocking. Ah, good for those recommendations. I'm going to go and see it, Evelyn. Uh, what what she thinks of the wine? How's the wine with the Tom de Savoie? And if she's got any plans to come over. <laughs> Hi, Evelyn. Hello. So, how are you? Uh, how are you enjoying the wine with the Tom de Savoie? Did that yes, answer the question? Nice. Yep. Uh, I actually went to Perth many years ago in November, but I didn't. At that time, I wasn't drinking any wine. So, right now, uh, he has piqued my interest. So, I should pay a visit. Definitely, definitely should I actually I didn't show you guys during the presentation. Uh, Bruce, do you want me to show you show them? There were a few pictures of the property. It's a really nice oh, area. Oh yeah, that's lovely. Okay, let me open it again. Upsie daisies. So here's the oh the sign. There it is. Got the properties outside. So that's the tasting area, right? Mm -hmm. The tasting area and quite often and this uh, in the left hand corner of that picture just behind the lady who's playing the guitar is my Merlot vineyard literally a meter and a half behind her but we're quite often on, on Sundays uh, have some live music and people will sort of come along you can see the bean bags things like that uh, just have a seat and we we don't sort of have a restaurant but we focus on cheese boards charcuterie uh, and we just want to be the people who focus on uh, great wine the cultural aspects of wine and just keep it really sort of uh, friendly and open 
and really that that sort of hospitality side of us and, and literally being surrounded by the vines is important and th this is actually uh in our in our sort of cellar door uh we just want people to come along sit down relax you know enjoy a flight of wine some charcuterie and you know just be amongst the vines the culture of the area and it's, it's very much sort of a statement that again there's there's this whole excitement about the, the not only the wine but the vines the area the culture of the area the the foods of the area yeah whole experience whole experience around the wine definitely well that's what's uh, awesome with wine <laughs> Oh, Evelyn, Evelyn seems very interested. Hopefully she'll, she'll be able to sing by. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me see if anybody has some questions or feedback they'd like to uh, give to Bruce. Or else I have a few questions that I have uh, lined up. Let me see. So you guys can either ask a question by using the raise hand option, or if you want, you can send it through. <laughs> the duck's coming through. You can send it through the, the comments. All right. Okay, while well, people are thinking of the first question they'd like to ask, I want to um, redirect a question that was sent to me. Um, so how was 2017, the vintage 2017, distinctive for your wine production compared to other years? Was it pretty, because you mentioned that the climate's pretty stable, but were there any particularities of that vintage? Oh, the, 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 the climate is, is quite stable year to year, but, but every vintage does have its its nuances and personality input. And so to me, the, the feature of 2017, that we had quite a, a moderate growing season for the duration of the season. And from probably about mid-March, uh, I usually go to work at sort of four or five o'clock in the morning. And from about mid-March or up to mid-March, we're wearing sort of board shorts and short sleeve shirts. But from about mid-March, it really starts cooling off. And so from mid-March towards the end of March, it really cools off and it's those beautiful cool conditions at the end of the season. And then we had what I describe as a perfect Indian summer. And so the Indian summer means it'll essentially go from the warmth of, of February and March to those beautiful, cool, sunny days, but, but you know, early, early 20s with the very gentle ripening. And so, for example, if you've got a glass of the 2017 Discovery Cabernet, this was picked on uh, the 11th of April. And so it just had that beautiful, gentle finish to the season. And that's translated through to its, the season's translated through to the personality of the wine by having the most uh, generous soft silky tannins um, but to me quite high levels of of perfumes and aromatics whereas for example I see say a vintage like the previous one uh, equally charming in my opinion but it had it had slightly more tannin structure slightly less perfumes and so it just had little little differences subtle differences to its personality but it's it's these annual differences that I find so important because uh, I'm not making uh, toothpaste that I want to be identical every time. I want there to be variation in these wines. And so it is a fun thing because I love it when I'm having a glass of this wine going, wow, 2017, ah, yes, I remember it was that beautiful long season. It's got fragrant perfumes the softness. So that was what typified 17 for me. Okay, uh, it ended up with a very delicious wine. Uh, Rick, Rick just left, but he was like, wanted to congratulate you on the wine. He's, he loved it and congratulate you also on your oh, holiday you. award as well. Your 2020 holiday award. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was really exciting because it was only uh, about uh, a couple of years beforehand that I'd made the big plunge to actually buy my vineyard. And so that holiday award uh, was such a lovely sort of recognition after sort of 
30 years in the, the wine industry, but it's really only been the last six years that I've had my Domain Naturalist wines, which have been my, my sort of forum to express myself. And it was just all about getting the timing right to start. And it was all about my two boys, Oscar and Tim, were old enough to get in and out of the car, put their seatbelts on. Uh, my wife, Wendy, who's such a big part of this business, then had a little bit more time to help me with the domain naturalist side of things because, you know, we're, we're sort of a small sort of family producer who just sort of pours our heart and soul into this and just so fortunate that we can have these wines and actually have people in Singapore enjoying them too. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you for those kind words. Everybody's enjoying the wine uh, today. Um, actually, speaking, another question about the wine was we've opened it. So some will finish the bottle, some will not. Uh, so how long can you store this wine, open and not open? Oh, wow, that's, that's tough for me to answer because in Australia, we don't know what half bottles of wine are. They're <laughs> only full or empty. So that's a tricky one. Uh, but a couple of, a couple of um, things that I like to do, that if I do have a full bottle of wine and I know that I'm not going to drink it all, is that I'll open it and get a, a smaller glass bottle that might be 375 more bottle and very gently decant the wine into it, completely fill it, put the lid on it and put it in the fridge. And so that will give another two or three days that you can take that wine out and it'll be very close to perfect. Um, so that, that's probably the best way. Uh, and another way is uh, you can buy the little containers of argon gas that you can spray on the top, but we don't have one of them. Uh, so quite often, actually, we have a soda stream at home. And so I'll actually open it, not stick the aerating thing into my wine, but actually squirt carbon dioxide from the soda, uh, soda stream on top of my wine, uh, put the lid on it, put it in the fridge. And so we've got the inert carbon dioxide, or if you've got the argon, you can put the argon on the top, uh, put it in the fridge because like anything, you put it in the fridge, the rates of all the, the reactions slow down uh, and it'll keep for a day or two. Don't keep it any longer though. Okay, so to, oh, not more than two or three years. Well, generally uh, that bo the bottle is finished by then. Um, <laughs> uh, how long can you store the 2017? So this has got a screw cap. How long would you recommend drinking it? Do you want to drink it now or drink it in a few years? Oh, I, I look at it that um, with, with the screw caps, they do give you um, this beautiful, what I call cruising altitude to enjoy the wines. Uh, and I think at least a wine like this um, will be just absolutely delicious over the next 10 years. So effectively till, till 2027. Uh, but for me, I, I typically like them sort of three to sort of eight years into their journey. Uh, but everyone's looking for something different because uh, while some people might be looking for the, the bouquet and development with time, I'm kind of sniffing and thinking and think, what was that season like? And I kind of like the freshness of the fruits and the, the tannin grip and the vibrancy of use. So it's very personal, but over the next decade. Okay. And if you're, if you're storing wine, treat it like milk. So keep it out of sunlight uh, because the wine, even if it's in a dark bottle, the sunlight is not kind to the wine. And just keep it at a, a stable temperature. So put it in a cupboard, somewhere cool, out of sunlight, and it will look after you. If you show the wine respect, it will respect you. Should put that on a mug. <laughs> good phrase, good, good phrase, good phrase. <laughs> uh, okay, well, thank you for that, for the answer for those who are curious uh, regarding its conservation. 
Uh, does anybody else have a question they'd like to ask uh, Bruce regarding the wine, regarding Margaret River, regarding uh, the vineyard in itself? So you can either use the raise hand uh, option on Zoom or send your question through the group chat. Let me see. Or just general feedback on the wine if you guys are... I've got a question. Okay, go ahead. What, Fire. what classic uh, uh, or, or cuisine that do you particularly associate with uh, Singapore that you think would, would be a match for this wine? Good question. Huh. Um, maybe I'll go see if someone has an idea in the... <laughs> in the, the public. I'm going to go check with Mr. Kenny. If Mr. Kenny, I'm going to mute you now. Maybe you have some ideas of local food we could pair with it. Hi, Kenny. Uh, actually, hi. hi. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm not very sure as well. Do you have any idea? Maybe a dish? Or, or, I don't... Somebody else. Yeah. Okay, you're not sure, not sure. All right, all right. Let me see if anybody else has maybe an, maybe an idea suggestion. It can be a crazy suggestion. All, all ideas are are good. Let me check with Brendan, maybe. Brendan, I'm going to unmute you now. Hey, um, someone said chili crab, which I think is quite a good idea, actually. And in fact, um, personal opinion-wise, I think wines actually taste pretty good with Asian cuisine because it's full body. And yeah, pretty much Chinese food, spicy stuff seems to go pretty well, but that's just personal preference I don't know about the rest yep yep so that's my I, take. I, I think someone agrees with you KK in the comments said chili crab so something with a bit of spice to it <laughs> I think that the cabernets do have that uh, depth of power definition of expression that does allow them to join and uh, w whether it's a, a classic matching or not but I, I do love uh, spice and hints of chili with uh, with my Cabernet because it has the richness to balance it out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see, Ross has an idea as well. He's, he's raised his hand. I'm going to unmute uh, him now. Sorry, I was going to say um, steak imported from Australia. Oh, good call. Well, that's what I had for dinner, but it wasn't imported. It was from the local shop. <laughs> you can only bring it back so much, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so those are some good ideas definitely to pair with it. It's a perfect pairing for uh, for red meat, obviously, but chili crab, okay, I'll try that next time. I'll try it on chili crab or something with a bit more spice to it, definitely. All right, uh, does anybody else have a last question, any last questions they would like to ask Bruce? Uh, once again, regarding the vineyard, the wine, or just general, if you guys want to give us some comments on the session, please don't hesitate to let me know. Let's see, let's see. Okay, nope, I think, uh, Ross, do you want yeah. to, you raised your hand again? Yeah, sorry, um, I'll try and get my video going again. Yes, yeah, so, oh, the light here. No, look, I just, there's a bit of a, um, uh, there's a bit of a move, or I'm seeing a bit of a movement towards other varieties of reds down in Mo River, from the Nebbiolos to, um, other varieties, which I guess, I don't know if you'd describe them as softer wines that a lot of people are blending with. Although having said that, I know quite a few guys are using them to make um, wine varieties out of those specific grapes. Um, Bruce, help me out here. What's some other um, examples? Um, maybe Petit Verdot as well. Petit um, Verdot, um, um, Dolcetto, Barbera, yep. so, uh, Nebbiolo, Sangiovese, Tempranillo. Yeah. So, my question to you, it, um, are you tempted by that, um, that trend or is your passion to stick solely to the, the cab service? Uh, oh, and, 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 I, I love and embrace so many different wines and the experimentation and exploration of new varieties. Uh, but for me, my, my journey is to seek mastery of the basics. And that's what I want to spend the rest of my career doing. 
And so better and better understanding the nuances of Margaret River Cabernet, uh, the different clones of Cabernet that we have. And if you think about a Granny Smith apple, uh, a Jonathan apple, you know, one's green, one's red. They're very different, but they're both apples. They're both different clones of the apple. Well, part of part of my journey is to try and understand some beautiful newer clones to the area, as well as embrace a lot of the history. Because you know what, a lot of those old timers, the way they did their clonal selection in the beginning, they got it very right. But for me, no, Ross, I want to seek mastery of Margaret River Cabernet and Margaret River Chardonnay, and I want to just finesse that journey but I'm equally delighted to go and drink uh, beautiful exotic varieties that my friends make. But I'm 53. I've probably got at least another 20 years left in terms of vintages and focus to take me to 73 years, hopefully a bit longer on the tour. So 20 or 30 years. So I've only got 20 to 30 years to really get to where I need to be with the basics and so that's my journey good stuff mate i'm the same age so hopefully you've got many years ahead of you <laughs> <laughs> good stuff cheers thank you ross thanks angela thank you guys thank you for those kind of yeah we hope you can uh, continue producing definitely the cabernet sauvignon for us as well all right, well, if uh, nobody else has any uh, last questions they would like to ask Bruce, I'm going to bring this session to an end. If once again, you guys do have questions that pop to mind in the days following the session, don't hesitate to let me know and I will send them over to Bruce to have them answered. Sure. Um, so just before I close the session, I usually do this for those who are not too camera shy. I do a lot of a little screenshot with uh, everybody raising their glass. If you guys have a glass of wine with you, if you don't want to be on the screenshot, no problem. But just give a heads up for those who would like to be in it. Okay. Mike's got his glass. Ross, Bruce, everybody. Mine is empty. All right. Okay. Everybody got their glass. And one, and uh, two. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you so much, Wine Connections, and all the lovely people in Singapore for being part of this conversation. And I hope at some point in time, I can welcome you to Margaret River. Come and visit us. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Yes, if you guys want to visit Margaret River, please do. Don't hesitate to swing by uh, the And the visit. easiest way to visit us is to pop down to Wine Connections, <laughs> pick up a bottle, twist the cap, pour it in the glass, and you're in Margaret River. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect All right. sentence Thank to you. end. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Have a nice evening. Ciao. Ciao. Bye now. <laughs> Bye. Stay safe.